Dobry wieczór. I'm going to begin by asking you to do something a little unfashionable. I want each of you today to fall in love with politics and with democracy. Don't laugh. Because if we pull back the veil of history, these words, politics, democracy, may mean something a lot different than what you think today. There's an expression I like from philosophy, the owl of Minerva takes flight at dusk. Minerva is the Roman goddess of wisdom and victory. And what the expression means basically is that while we experience the world, looking forward, living our lives, making mistakes, we only find wisdom at the end of the day when we can look back. Now, the Greeks had a different name for her. Anyone know? Athena, yes. And the story I want to tell will have us looking back 25 centuries to a radical experiment in the city that, according to legend, she founded. And yes, this is a very political story, but maybe not in the way you think. The year is 508 BC. Athena's city is not the leader of the Greek world, neither the most powerful nor the most sophisticated. Its ruler is Hippias, son of the dead tyrant Pisistratus, who took power 50 years before and ruled by keeping Athens' noble families in check. Well, the tyrant's son was a weaker sort, as they often are, and the old aristocrats saw an opening and had Hippias forced into exile. A power struggle follows. The leader of one clan, Isagoras, allies himself with Sparta, who is at that point the superpower of the Greek world with an invincible army. And Aristotle tells us that the leader of another clan named Cleisthenes did something unexpected. He writes that Cleisthenes makes the Athenian people his ally. This was unexpected because the people, the demos, was not at this point a well-organized political force. You see, the system at this point in Athens was dominated by families of noble blood who claimed descent from the gods. Now, there were juries uh, and a citizen's assembly, but its power was small. And its impact was limited by the fact that the people participating often felt more loyal to their local neighborhood or village than to the city, to the city as a whole. Cleisthenes wins the big power struggle of 508 BC. And now the new man in Athens has a choice. Is he going to use his popular support to consolidate his own personal power, as the others would have done? Or will his alliance with the people of Athens be something more than a short-term political play? To see how it turned out, let's jump ahead a few decades. It's a bright morning in 430 BC. And the Citizens' Assembly of Athens is about to meet. As the citizens come in to the side of the Acropolis, they can look up and see a magnificent temple, the Parthenon, brand new. You see, Athens is now the most wealthy and powerful of all the thousand cities in the Greek world. When the citizens take their seats, a herald announces, Tis agarewen bulletai. Who wishes to speak? The floor is open. Draft laws have been prepared by a smaller body of 500 citizens called the council. And uh, these draft laws, uh, let's say on foreign policy or taxes or improvements to the port, any citizen could raise their hand, take the floor, speak for or against the idea, suggest improvements. And when the debate was finished, a herald calls a vote. All votes count the same. A simple majority can change laws, make treaties, make completely new policies, whatever the demos of Athens decides on that day. No president, no prime minister, no elected parliament. To run their vast commercial empire from Sicily to the Black Sea, there was no bureaucracy, no high commission of experts. The real kratos, the power in politics, was with the demos, the people were in charge. Now, you're thinking, this would be chaos, right? And yet, over 150 years, 
the more that democracy took hold in Athens, the more that the poor and non-urban citizens played a part in it, the stronger and more successful the city became. Architecture, trade, medicine, drama, philosophy. This strange system of self-government gave history a golden age. How do they do it? Now let's return to Cleisthenes, the victorious aristocrat and ally of the people in 508. It was he who made the ecclesia, the citizens' assembly, the center of political life. And he apparently realized that to make it work, he would have to have citizens collaborate in a new way. So he passed a new law which assigned each citizen of Athens to one of 10 new civic tribes. In your tribe, you would have now a new identity you would share with citizens from the three main regions of Athens. Your last name was now your civic name, uh, one of the 10 mythical heroes of ancient Athens. And new rituals linked you to people in your neighborhood, but also across the city and to the glorious past. Next, he reorganized the council, the boule. Each year, its 500 members would be chosen by lottery, 50 from each of the 10 tribes. Now, being selected for the council was a great honor, and it was a lot of work. But in your year, you would get experience on a whole range of real issues, and more importantly, you would get social knowledge, the knowledge of who the smartest person was on any issue, who you could trust, how to decide. Almost every citizen in Athens took a turn on the council. And when your year was out, you would return to your local neighborhood and share this new knowledge, your new network of relationships, your practical experience in the assembly and at home. Well, what about the experts? Yes, there were a small number of elected posts for citizens of outstanding ability in warfare or budgets or civil engineering. But these were one-year renewable terms, and the assembly could recall them at any time. And this is the point. In Athens, yes, there were leading citizens, but no ruling class. Every citizen was allowed and expected to contribute. Technical knowledge and social, social knowledge equally drove Athens' success. And this is the fun part. When any one person got too much power, by a vote of 6,000 of his fellow citizens writing his name on a piece of pottery, he could be ostracized. That meant sending him into a temporary exile, uh, although his family and his property would remain safe. And there was more. Historians like Paul Cartledge, who I studied with, and Josiah Ober have shown how Athens built a whole culture of democracy. Glorious festivals like the city Dionysia, where Athenians would have a public holiday and all the citizens would get together and drink and dance and watch theater competitions with Aeschylus and Sophocles, the inventors of Western theater, building the collective memory of the city and helping with their plays. The citizens think through problems of justice and of duty. And guess what? It was the richest Athenians who supported this. They gave what were called liturgiae, liturgies, to support this public culture. And the poorest citizens were compensated for the time that they served on juries and the council. It was exciting. It was competitive. It was noisy. It was fun. This was the life of the polis. This was politics. Now, out of 192 countries in the world, there are about 120 or more that call themselves democracies. But not the Czech Republic, not the US, not even Switzerland looks anything like this. Why? Well, the answer, it's the Romans' fault. Now, the Romans, like the Athenians, threw out a hated ruler around 500 BC and began a system of self-government, which they called in their own language, res publica, the public thing. But this Roman Republic, still very small and far from the action in Italy, looked very different from the democratia in Athens. For one thing, in Athens, the core principle was equality, isonomia, equal justice under law, isegoria, equal access to the public debate. In Rome, however, it wasn't equality, but hierarchy that ruled. 
Citizens in the assembly voted in groups, not as individuals, and your wealth determined the power of your vote. Citizens weren't asked who wishes to speak, but told, vote for me, filling a long ladder of magistracies in increasingly competitive and, and expensive elections. These magistrates, who were often the sons and grandsons of magistrates, well, these became Rome's ruling elite. And once you were uh, elected to a high enough office, well, guess what? You became a senator for life. The great orator and statesman Cicero said, the Roman people are free. But what he meant was not free to propose ideas or make decisions, but free to choose smart people like him to govern. And if this all sounds a little familiar, it should. The Athenian experiment in self-government, glorious as it was, came to an end in the fourth century with the conquest of Alexander the Great. And again in the second century when all of Greece became a province in Rome's rising empire. However, in Cicero's lifetime in the first century BC, the Roman Republic collapsed in civil war. And for the next 15 centuries, it wasn't republics and democracies, but emperors and kings who held center stage in Europe. But the legacy of Rome remained strong in Roman law, the Latin language, the hierarchies of the Catholic Church. So in the Enlightenment, when thinkers were looking back to antiquity for inspiration, it was natural. It wasn't Athens they looked to, but Rome. Reading theorists like Cicero, the founding fathers of America and France, took inspiration and built ideas of sovereignty, voluntas populi, the will of the people, tied firmly to the Roman model. A free people has their say, not in assemblies, but in elections. An educated elite should rule. If you don't believe me, read the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Read the Constitution. Read the French Declaration des droits de l'homme. And count how many times you see the word democracy. The answer is zero. We live in republics, Roman republics. Why then do we call ourselves democracies? Well, in the 19th and 20th centuries, as the right to vote expanded, the battle cry was democracy, power to the people. But, and this is the crucial point, we did not get more democracy in the Athenian sense. Even as the electorate expanded to include the poor and women and minorities, the power of the people as a whole did not increase. Instead, the real day-to-day -day control over government, the real power to decide, lies as firmly in the hands of an elite today as it did in 1789 or in Cicero's Rome. In fact, with the growth of unelected bureaucracies or senators serving 40 years in office or the very Roman electoral college, an Athenian would say, we've gone backwards, not forwards. An Athenian would say, We've forgotten what democracy really is. And what we call democracy, the vast majority of us don't have access to important decisions, just the chance every so often to choose between groups of politicians we don't really like. And what's worse, we're taught in school this is how democracy should be, that everyday people don't care or they're not smart enough. To which I say, nonsense. We can solve this crisis if we change our attitude about what politics is and what democracy should be. To do this, I think we need to solve three paradoxes of our time right now. The first is the paradox of nationalism. The world is growing ever more mobile and interconnected, and yet nationalism isn't declining as a political force. It's increasing. The second is the paradox of populism. We've learned the hard way in the last few years that when voters feel excluded or ignored or talked down to, they start looking around for other options, even dangerous ones. Our democracies turned out to be really good at producing out-of-touch elites, and smart politicians win votes today by going after the establishment in Brussels or Madrid or Washington, D.C. You see, I believe the populists 
have found the design flaw in representative democracy. This is a system that produces a ruling class. And a lot of voters don't like it. So what do we do? Do we take more power away from the voters? Double down on technocrats? Do we try to beat the populists at their own game? Or do we try to change the game? The third is the paradox of information. You have more access right now to more information in your pocket than Cleisthenes or Cicero had in their lifetimes. So why are our decisions in politics getting less scientific, getting less based on real knowledge, getting more based on emotion and fake news? Well, to solve these paradoxes, we need to go back to the system Cleisthenes built and generations of Athenians refined and see why their system worked so well. First, Athens teaches us nationalism thrives because all citizens crave a common story. The public culture of Athens overflowed with rituals and stories and, and mythic heroes. These weren't distractions. This was the texture of democracy, the way in which we imagined ourselves as part of a commonwealth. And this is where the word politics is very interesting. At the very beginning of this word, the word polis was a fortress, a safe place set in stone. And the fifth century BCE, which is a century of great democratic innovation, was also an age of war and mass migration, not so different from today. When Persia invaded and burned Athens in the 480s, the temples were on fire, but the polis was unharmed. The citizens evacuated, and the general said, we're going to be okay because it's the citizens who are the city. This is why Paul Cartledge says, polis is not a city-state. Polis is a citizen-state because it's relationships and stories, not buildings and streets that bind us together. So we should embrace this need for story. And like the Athenians, make our common story not about keeping things the same or about making something great again, but by using the past as a springboard for the future. Next, the problem of populism. I'm convinced the populists will keep winning as long as the other politicians refuse to share control. We need to stop saying that democracy can only function through elites, that so-called average voters are stupid or they don't care. Cleisthenes showed that if you design the right system, not only can a democracy make good decisions, it can outcompete more top-down systems, just as Athens outcompeted more than a thousand other cities to become the leader of the Greek world. Now, citizens don't just magically acquire this expertise. You need to build these habits of self-government through problem-solving and debate. I've seen with my own eyes that if you give citizens the chance to have a real impact, they suddenly start to care a lot more about politics. Ancient Athens teaches us what citizen expertise looks like, that technical knowledge and social knowledge can be combined in an intelligent way. But how do we know what's true? The final answer is only by experience. Less time behind screens, more time solving problems. I've seen that when everyday people get the chance to do more than just yell at the TV or complain on Facebook, ideology suddenly becomes a lot less important. In Athens, democracy wasn't a chapter in a textbook. It was a living culture where action was education. But you're saying, we're so busy. How can we find the time to do all this? Well, this is where we need to choose our priorities, individually and as a society. Athens chose to have their richest citizens give back, to support the infrastructure and the culture of their democracy. They took education of the young extremely seriously, transmitting their values through stories and rituals. Economics and education, these are inseparable from politics. And if robots and AI really do free up more of our time, we can choose to watch more movies on Netflix or we can choose to join together and get to work building a society that includes and values everyone. So here's my conclusion. Only active citizenship can save democracy. If we're going to beat the populists, we need more 
better designed channels of citizen participation. Many more. Before I go, there's an elephant in the room. What about Brexit? Didn't the people make a terrible choice? Listen, Brexit isn't an argument against democracy. It's an argument against badly designed democracy. A well-designed system doesn't just ask for a show of hands. It invites participation through social knowledge. It opens space to deliberate and hear both sides. It values experience over ideology. That's what Brexit and most of these referendums don't do. But this is how collective intelligence gets built. And this is not just a dream of an ancient past. This is happening now, and we're just starting to explore what's possible. In cities from Helsinki to Maputo, Mozambique, citizens are giving their social knowledge to improve delivery of public services in their neighborhood. Over 3,000 cities and regions are letting their citizens propose and debate over where to spend public money. An idea of participatory budgeting, born in Brazil and now scaled up in places like New York and Paris and, yes, even Prague. And just last month, the European Union, the high church of technocrats, invited 96 randomly selected citizens to Brussels to debate over which questions to ask 500 million people in advance of next year's elections. Democracy can only survive if our model of ruling elites can evolve into a model of collective intelligence. So what can you do about it? Learn about these innovations. Spread the word to your friends and put pressure on politicians to join the movement for participation. Okay, what if the politicians don't want to? Well, here, the Czech people have already helped save the world. Men like Jan Patochka, Václav Havel, trapped in a rigid and oppressive system, proposed a new idea, the parallel polis. It began in the 1960s with underground theaters and bands, reading groups and dissidents connecting across borders to build a civic culture outside the official system. The parallel polis was, for Havel, the effort of a certain part of society to live as a society within the truth. All changes in a broken system, he wrote, must come from below. The parallel polis isn't an escape, but an embrace of our responsibility. It must be accessible to anyone. It must point beyond itself to a more general solution. This was the same song Pericles was singing 25 centuries earlier when he said to his polis, make up your mind that your happiness depends on being free, and freedom depends on being courageous. Fix your eyes on the greatness of Athens as she really is, and fall in love with her. So yes, we should fall in love with politics, with the life of the polis, where we grew up, where we move to, or that we make for ourselves. To re-enchant politics, each of us must become an artisan of democracy. And we should do better than the ancients did, more inclusive of women, more inclusive of immigrants, better able to scale up the conversation from thousands to millions. Walt Whitman said, democracy is a word whose history is yet to be written because that history has yet to be enacted. So let's design a real democracy that combines ageless wisdom with dazzling innovation. No one will do it for us. It's up to you and me. Thank you.